Uh, okay, the next the next person is here, uh, Benjamin Girard from UCSD. Uh, he will tell us about developing new adaptive optics wavefront sensing technologies for WM tools. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, so, yeah, I'm at UC Santa Cruz, but only until today, actually, on Monday, I'm starting a new uh, research scientist position at Lawrence Livermore. So, it'll be sad to uh, leave our uh, louder. Or, I speak softly. Uh, our great group at the uh, Center for Adaptive Optics there, but it's still in the Bay Area, and I look forward to uh, continue uh, collaborating on projects. All right, so here's my uh, one slide of uh, science motivation for the rest of the talk that's just adaptive optics instrumentation. So uh, on the left, this is uh, the science data product of the new. Um, exoplanet detection from the Gemini planet imager, 51 Eridani B. So to where the arrow is right there, and the movie is showing different wavelengths, the data cube, and so the planet gets brighter uh, there and uh, dimmer at other wavelengths due to methane absorption in the planet's atmosphere. This is what the raw data uh, that's used to produce these images on the left looks like. Now the exoplanet is over a hundred times below the noise. We can't see any exoplanet in this image. And this is all scattered starlight. Um, we call that um, speckles, um, but they're close to the star. You can see stuff evolving. These are minutes uh, exposure times faster than that down to millisecond time scales from residual atmospheric turbulence. And all around the image, there's sort of minute and hour time scales of um, quasi static evolution. So, um, if we can subtract or attenuate these speckles better, we can see planets fainter than 51 Ari B and closer to the star, uh, motivating why we want to develop uh, new technology to do that. All right, so uh, just a very simple overview of um, adaptive optics to uh, start from a clean slate. So, light coming in from the telescope hitting a deformable mirror to correct for turbulence, but how do we measure it? So typically there's a beam splitter or a dichroic that sends some light to a wavefront sensor. Uh, most of you who um, have used Keck adaptive optics probably have used the Jack Hartman wavefront sensor. So here's just a simple conceptual illustration. There's a grid of lenses, which for a flat wavefront uh, creates a grid of spots, a grid of PSFs that um, deviate from their sub-apertures, the center of their sub-apertures for an unflat wavefront. And so if we can just measure the X and Y position of each spot relative to a flat wavefront, we can use the, um, the uh, detector on this wavefront sensor to drive the deformable mirror to drive these spots back to the center of their sub-apertures and flatten the wavefront. So um, where my uh, research comes in is really in um, adding a second wavefront sensor, which normally in a conventional diagram, this would be the science camera. So that's one type of uh, second stage wavefront sensing, which um, is illustrated here. At one point in this uh, just real time sequence, a deformable mirror is, is making part of the image dark. This is laboratory data. Some of you may be familiar with work that Mike Bottom is doing. A speckle milling on Keck. So this is building on that um, in, in different ways. But also um, a pyramid wavefront sensor. This is um, also on uh, Keck 2 that uh, some of you have used. But I'm thinking of this now in this context of a second wavefront sensor, uh, using it at the same time as a first wavefront sensor and uh, what we can gain from that. So in this talk, I'm going to present three different second wavefront sensor technologies that I've been working on. Uh, and most of that is with uh, laboratory development. Um, so this is, you know, we're in the early stages of just testing out these concepts before we bring it to a telescope. And this has been using the uh, Santa Cruz Extreme Adaptive Optics Lab uh, test bed. So this is just a, a conceptual diagram here. And you can see that uh, I'm certainly not going to walk through all the components. I'll just uh, highlight the, the capabilities of 
with four different deformable mirrors, um, six different wavefront sensors, and a uh, software interface, a real-time control uh, controller that can connect all of these components, uh, similar to uh, the Pyramid wavefront sensor uh, system on Keck, but allowing um, high-level uh, code writing in, in Python, which is really great to have a bunch of students and postdocs working on all of these different hardware components. So um, these are all people other than me that um, have been uh, working with me on a variety of uh, projects using this test bed. Um, so here's all the students and postdocs down here and all the PIs and support staff up here. And um, it's a really great group. Uh, certainly without the support engineers, uh, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of this. And uh, uh, we're really grateful to have these opportunities. All of these topics have uh, SPIE papers from uh, just a few months ago. So I encourage you to check those out. All right, so now I'll just uh, dive into uh, the first uh, uh, wavefront sensing technology called FAST, um, the FAST atmospheric self-burning camera technique. So um, I'm illustrating the concept in these movies here. So imagine the atmosphere just had varying indices of refraction um, that only created a sine wave of aberration over the pupil of the telescope. And then imagine the wind is blowing that sine wave across the pupil of the telescope in a single layer. That would look like this. In a normal focal plane image, that creates a pair of um, speckles and scattered starlight that don't change as that sine wave moves across the pupil. And the self coherent camera technique forms fringes intentionally in the science image that just translate across the speckle. So essentially, in a single image, you can um, use that as a wavefront sensor, where normally you'd have to use additional techniques to resolve that ambiguity. The normal self coherent camera forms these fringes way too dim to operate on fast timescales. Um, fast is a technique I developed in my PhD to make the fringes much brighter to enable uh, using this down to millisecond timescales. All right, so here's what we've been doing in the lab. So this is now a shock carbon wavefront sensor as the uh, first stage correction. So we're simulating turbulence with the deformable mirror and then uh, not cheating, using the shack hartman to measure the turbulence. So here is the Y and X slopes, which are just the deviation of the position of these spots that I showed in the previous diagram with respect to a flat wavefront. And then when the uh, deformable mirror correction turns on, the uh, amount of aberration decreases. And you can see in the chronographic image that this you know, blurred out uh, PSF gets much sharper, and now we can start to think about second stage wavefront sensing and control um, after that. So then uh, that's what this is. So uh, uh, now we have turbulence from just residual AO correction playing on a high order deformable mirror, and then um, using two deformable mirrors to correct that turbulence now with the science image as the wavefront sensor. And you can see when the loop, higher loop closes there, our simulated off-axis laser light source as an exoplanet is much more easier uh, to see. So uh, that's sort of two separate demonstrations where we are now. We, we've, we've gotten to a point running in real time at 200 Hertz and 100 Hertz, uh, both of these loops that they're, they're performing well and working separately. So next, it's gonna be really exciting to actually combine these. This is a more complicated uh, real time uh, control system, but um, this is now the point when we can uh, do that confidently. All right, the second second wavefront sensor uh, is uh, called the uh, pupil chopping. So uh, first, uh, this has been really impressive. I've been working with an undergraduate student on developing this concept, um, uh, first uh, research project, and this has been a really hard topic uh, to, to dive into, and uh, it's really great to see all this work developing. So um, it's a really simple concept. You just, this, this second uh, sensor is a science camera that's just imaging a point spread function. So um, what's really nice about this uh, concept is it's broadly applicable uh, beyond um, exoplanet imaging, it just needs to image a PSF. So this is nice for um, uh, uh, solar system science or uh, crowded field sensing, or even uh, with a laser guide star if the camera is imaging the uh, uh, focal plane of the uh, uh, laser guide star. So uh, there's a lot of potential here. And um, 
I'm not uh, showing how it works. So here's how it works. These are um, some simulations in the top row and some uh, laboratory images with seal in the bottom row. Um, and it basically, the deformable mirror uh, makes this local tilt shape. So it's just a small deviation from the flat shape with a deformable mirror that creates a point spread function that um, looks like these images. It's sort of like an intentionally misaligned JWST image where one of the segments is, is tilted. And then uh, in the second frame, you just uh, flatten the deformable mirror again, and you bounce back and forth between uh, the tilted shape and the flat shape. And um, that's it. You just need two images to uh, do this wavefront sensing technique to resolve the sign ambiguity of uh, relative phase, like I was talking about earlier. And the rest of it is pretty standard adaptive optics. Uh, so here's a demonstration of that in real time. This is the um, unchopped image where it's just showing the point spread function. Again, we're playing turbulence on the deformable mirror and then applying correction at a certain point. And you can see the stack of images without the correction and with the correction show a, a you know, dimmer halo and we're closing the loop. We, uh, these are the radial profiles um, for all of those cases, and we're improving the scroll ratio by about 20%. And that's just a simple demonstration. There's still a lot to work on. Um, this is with a low order deformable mirror. So we're going to look at higher order control, optimizing various parameters, like how much do you tilt the this uh, local part of the deformable mirror and how much of the pupil is actually uh, doing the tilting. Uh, and then integrating this with first stage wavelength sensors like uh, the Shack Hartman. Got about a minute left. Okay. All right. So, uh, last concept the bright pyramid wavefront sensor. So, uh, again, many of you have been familiar with the uh, current pyramid wavefront sensor uh, on Keck 2. This is basically modifying this uh, four sided uh, pyramid optic in an intermediate focal plane with an additional piston phase shift in the central lambda over D that diffracts more light into the uh, pupils compared to uh, the regular pyramid. And it turns out that uh, improves performance. So these are some simple simulations showing for some input residual adaptive optics errors, the output is better for a uh, bright pyramid. Um, so we've tested this in the lab. These are some masks that we've had fabricated. Uh, this is, by the way, um, collaborating with a uh, new uh, postdoc coming to UC Santa Cruz, Vincent Chambouillard. Um, so uh, look forward to uh, working with him more. Uh, these are some images for the regular and bright pyramid that looks like it's doing what we want to do. There's sort of more light in the pupil footprints there. And um, without going into a lot of detail, we're measuring in the lab uh, improved linearity. So this is like inputting some known Zernike modes and reconstructing what we get out for those modes with uh, conventional adaptive optics techniques, uh, where the dotted lines for each color are sort of showing more linearity than the corresponding solid line. Um, so this looks good. Everything is uh, uh, promising, and there's some more work to do in closing the loops and combining this with the first stage wavelength sensor. And lastly, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, being quick on time, Redwoods, I uh, brought this up uh, yesterday and uh, was presented in a couple of contexts. This, this is a new uh, uh, technology uh, demonstration that we'd like to deploy on Keck. We don't have funding yet. It would reuse the existing pyramid wavelength sensor plate and deploy a couple of optics uh, in blue here to turn that uh, existing detector into a, a focal plane imager or chronographic imager um, in various configurable modes that could still use the pyramid wavelength sensor. And there's a uh, CAD. Uh, diagram where we, we did some basic uh, preliminary design showing that these various deployable components here and there and there can all um, fit in the existing layout. All right, so uh, yeah, that's it. Um, I presented a couple of different second wavefront sensor concepts uh, that uh, are all uh, shown here, jazz, tubal chopping, and the bright pyramid wavefront sensor, all of which could be implemented in the future on uh, redwoods and actually pupil chopping, which in principle could be implemented now in a couple of ways on CAC. Thank you. Why can't you 
Yeah. So could I mean, you, could you repeat real quick? Oh yes, repeating the question. So why can't you just replace the first Jack Hartman wavefront sensor with some of these improved wavefront sensing technologies? So actually, for um, this uh, bright pyramid wavefront sensor, you could. Um, it's uh, but for these other two, you can't, and it has to do with uh, the dynamic range of the wavefront sensor. So the strength of aberration that is going in uh, before being corrected in uh, for the cases of those two wavelength sensors is too large. So the atmosphere just produces too much turbulence. And so you would need a, a first stage correction in order for them to be able to close the loop and control the deformable mirror. Um, and it turns out with this bright pyramid sensor, uh, we're thinking that it would be better in this um, second stage configuration for the same reason because of dynamic range. Well, if it's a science camera, none at all, because it's already there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the best answer that uh, there shouldn't be any. Thank you very much.